All right, Nick Coates, great to have you on Way Too Busy today. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Oh, great. All right, so we got a lot to talk about today. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I met you first um, on a on a platform that who knows if it will exist in about a year's time. I met you first on Twitter and seeing <laughs> after uh, uh, seeing some of your posts on there, and uh, we got talking about obviously a strong shared interest that we have um, in the if you like remote work lifestyle, you can call it that. Um, and we've had several interesting discussions since then, and it became very obvious to me that uh, we wanted to have you on the, on the pod today. Um, got a ton to talk about, as I say, so let's, let's go straight into it. I know that you've been personally working outside of an office setting for some time. So help, help our audience understand when that journey began for you, when you realized that you were not somebody who was going to be sitting in a in a cubicle from nine to five every day yeah um so th this is an interesting conversation because i've never worked in an office um and i've actually asked this question before of some people where i'm like should i go work in an office so that i can better talk about like why it's not a good thing do you know what i mean or do i just <laughs> sound like you know maybe i would love to work in an office i have no idea um, but no, I've never worked in an office. So um, I dropped out of college in 2014 and then immediately started working in startups. Uh, and so I got my quote unquote degree of, uh, you know, not from college, but from working in startups and, and had a lot of failures, had some successes, uh, some even bigger failures, and then eventually kind of discovered this remote work world and digital nomad world, so to say. Um, and I kind of figured out that I was probably going to have to go down this path because so uh, I need to go back a little bit further to high school. And and so obviously from my name, uh, Mitko Karshavsky, I, I was not born in the United States. I was born in Bulgaria. And when I immigrated to the United States, I was 10 years old. And growing up in the U.S., I kind of never quite felt like I fit in because I was always not that I not that I wasn't welcomed in some way, but I was always known as the Bulgarian kid, right? And then I'd go back to Bulgaria, and everybody would know me as the American kid. And I wasn't just I was just kind of like nowhere was I just like a kid. Nowhere was I just like a part of the like you know a, a perfect part of the community. I almost always existed a little bit on the outside, looking in in some way. And so growing up, I never quite felt like I could see this world in which, hey, I'm just going to live here and, you know, occupy this 100 mile square radius square, you know, whatever of, of land and like never really leave. I always wanted a life that was like more global in some sense. And so um, in high school, I was actually really focused in sciences um, and I was a biotechnology student. I was in a very competitive biotechnology program through high school, worked on a lot of a capstone projects and stuff like that. And that was my plan. So I went to college. I was a microbiology and biotech major in college. And um, I was really into biotech. And when I got to college, it was literally like day two. I was sitting in a lab and I was like, oh my God, I hate this. Uh, and it was shocking to me because this was something that I really enjoyed. And I had this realization, you know, I, I kind of struggled through this period of why do I not like this thing that I really liked before? And what I realized was that my biotech program in high school was very entrepreneurial. It was very like you make your own schedule, you work on what you want to work on, like figure out the problems that you want to work on. And it I kind of it was a much more entrepreneurial setting and what I what I experienced in college was like sit on this chair, do these lab exercises, uh, and do X, Y, Z. And so that was like the closest, you know, when you ask like, how do I know that an office life isn't for me? It's because I sat through those labs and I was like, okay, something else, like this is not the way that I want to work. Um, and so that's kind of like how I, you know, the, the long story of how I, uh, ended up doing what I do now. We're living the life that I live now. That is truly fascinating. And there's a lot that resonates with me personally there. I, I, I also am a, a, am an expat and I've having spoken to a bunch of expats about this issue. What I've come to the conclusion of is that, that if you are an expat, you are, you can be kind of at home almost anywhere, 
but you're never fully at home mm-hmm. anywhere because you've gone through that experience, the exact experience that, that you're talking about, right? So when I go back to the UK, I'm American. And when I'm in the US, I'm the British guy. Or in many cases, right. I don't really know your accent anymore. I know you're not American, but I don't know where you're from, that guy. <laughs> but, but, uh-huh. uh, but it's so interesting because it, it does seem in speaking to a lot of the people that we speak to that actually do really well outside of a formal office setting, oftentimes it's connected to something like that. So very, very intriguing. Have you ever heard the term third culture kid before? No. So a third culture kid, and I can't really remember who came up with this term. Um, if you're listening to this, you may have to like do the research on, on who or where this term kind of like originates from. But it's this idea that you have as a child, you grow up outside of the culture of your parents. Mm. And then you combine your parental culture and your new culture into sort of its own mixture of it. So an example of this would be, you know, I speak Bulgarian. We live in the United States. And what we've come to speak is this like mixture of Bulgarian English because some words in Bulgarian are better to describe what you're experiencing than the ones in English and vice versa, right? So you you speak this like third language. It's a mixture of the two. And I recently had... um, Matthew Grolnick on on my podcast, That Remote Life, who is a, a an amazing uh, an amazing guy. He works for the Mastercard Foundation um, in Africa, kind of doing a lot of this like future of work work over there. And what we talked about with him was that actually there's now, you know, growing up, I know a lot of these third culture kids because mm-hmm. um, Bulgaria, I think in the early two thousands, entered the European Union. So everybody that I know that I grew up with in Bulgaria ended up living in like. England and Germany and Spain and, you know, they're kind of all over. Yeah. Um, but now what you're finding is that a lot of these people who are working remotely or have been nomadic for pre since pre-COVID are having kids. And so these kids are now like third culture kids on steroids because they're not just growing up in one culture that's mixing with their parental culture. Their, their parental culture is mixing with like a whole bunch of different cultures. Um, and I think that that's going to be a very interesting generation. Uh, and I'm very curious to see kind of how these kids grow up and how that impacts the way they, they view things. Wow. So you use the term nomad there, which I think is really interesting. And I know you, you commonly on your own podcast talk about, talk about this idea of a digital nomad. So, um, it's not a term we've used a lot on this pod. So I wonder if you could, Mm -hmm. if you could describe what you mean by digital nomad and then also i wonder if you could describe what it means for you personally yeah so a digital nomad is someone who generates their income remotely um and chooses to not have a home base or chooses to not have one set address so to say um you know, a lot of times digital nomads are like characterized as constant travelers. You know, they're working on laptops. They're moving from country to country to country constantly. And they're never like, you know, there's some people who may travel often and they always come back to like one home destination, one address and then travel. But digital nomads are kind of constantly moving, right? They're nomadic. They're like a digital interpretation of what we can think about as like hunter gatherer nomadic tribes. Uh, what that means for me is it's funny because there's been a lot of discussion of like, what is a digital nomad, Mm -hmm. right? How often should you move to be a digital nomad? What if you move every year? Does that still count? Um, so for me, uh, I, you know, started out moving around quite a bit and then, um, you know, I've slowed down, which is very common is like nomads kind of slow down. Uh, over time and they kind of find the place that they like and they'll go back to those places. So for me, like in a perfect world, um, I like to live through what I call home bases. So having two or three home bases around the world where I roughly know, hey, here's where this place is, here, you know, kind of knowing the the general layout of that destination and then using that location as a springboard to then go and visit other places if I want to. And those home bases can change, you know, every couple of years if I want them to. But that at the moment for me, I found having three home bases 
around the world. So right now my home bases are the United States, Bulgaria, and Mexico. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, kind of like spending like four months ish in each one of those to me feels really, really good. And it's, it's this amount of time where um, I can, you know, settle down and and build uh, routines in those places, but not long enough to where I'm getting like restless and I'm like, all right, like I'm getting bored. Let's go to the next place. Uh, so for me, that's kind of the way that the digital nomad lifestyle is, you know, living out in my life. So this is obviously a community that you know pretty well. Um, would it be fair to say that a lot of the the people that fit into this category are either single or married without kids or, or you know, relationships without kids? What what how how does it track to the to the nature of the people that pursue this this type of mm-hmm. lifestyle? You know, it's interesting because until two years ago, Mm -hmm. you know, we're recording this in 2022. um, This was definitely a very single, uh, young um, male, mostly, even though now there's more and more women who are are nomads. But like historically, it was uh, very male dominated, uh, young single males who were working in tech or had their own businesses, their entrepreneurs. And that has really changed very, very quickly. Um, and in many ways, the digital nomad community, I feel like is like a teenager where it just had a growth spurt and is still trying to figure out how to use it's like, you know, you see like a 14 year old who just grew eight inches in one summer and they kind of like don't really know how their arms work yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. It's um, it's kind of similar because uh, now post COVID, we are seeing more and more families becoming nomadic. We're seeing more and more. Uh, families with kids. I mean, I'm married, I'm nomadic with my wife, but even more, I know even more people who are nomadic with their kids, or at least are, you know, a slower version of a nomad, so Mm -hmm. to say. Um, So it's, you know, it's interesting because it's changing very rapidly. But yeah, historically, I'd say it was like a young, single male, you know, male or female kind of thing, but um, it's changing very quickly. Fascinating. So, having lived this lifestyle for some time, what have been the best parts of the journey for you? And what have been the most challenging? Um, I think the best parts are that you have this continuous, like sense of energy that comes from moving and having to relearn a place. There's something really exciting about, the very common parts of your routine feeling like adventure. Mm. Um, You know, like if you go out to the grocery store at home, it's not, it may not seem as exciting because you know exactly what that grocery store is going to look like. Everyone speaks the same language. Uh, Most grocery stores have the exact same product. You know, it's kind of like this thing that you're very, very used to. When you're nomadic, you, those very common routines feel like adventure, right? Like you go to the grocery store and you're like, oh, wow, like what do they sell over here? And it's interesting they've set it up this way and everyone speaks a different language and you kind of have to like figure that out. Um, And it's the same thing to go into a restaurant or a coffee shop or just your day-to-day life feels very adventurous. And that's really fun um, to me, at least. I'm, I'm sure it can, for some people, it may not be. So that is the best part. And obviously, you know, getting to travel at a young age, which is something that so many people like leave for retirement, right? Like in the United States, at least you have this thing of like, okay, well, I'm going to work on them until I'm like 60, save up some money, 65, and then I'm going to retire and live, right? Mm -hmm. And they save all this travel. You ask people, what do you want to do with your time? Everyone says like, oh, I'd love to travel more. Well, in this way, you're able to like not save travel for retirement and live a really great lifestyle while you're still young and can enjoy that lifestyle. Um, The hardest thing is definitely you have to rebuild your community. Um, So a lot of people will tell you that the hardest thing about being a digital nomad is a lack of community or a lack of long-term relationships. But I don't think that that's true. I don't agree with that there is a lack of the relationships. You simply have to rebuild your relationships in your community. Mm -hmm. So for the first two years that we were nomadic, my wife and I felt really lonely um, because we didn't have friends. And, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen like How I Met Your Mother, Mm -hmm. but that was something that like I really like wanted, which is like to come down, you know, stairs and like, you know, come out of my apartment. There's the bar. And I know that my friends are going to be in that bar and kind of seeing those people having that like that community uh, is something that I really wanted. And 
what we found was that it takes about two years for you to rebuild your community with people who do what you do. So now our life is actually, we do have that how I met your mother experience because wherever we travel, we're either planning our travels based around what our friends are doing um, or wherever we go, we know there's going to be people there. And so uh, now we do have that community, you know, um, we're going to Mexico, like I said, in, um, in, in a couple of months, in a month or month and a half. And we're going to be there for three and a half months. And I know a bunch of people that are there that I can't wait to see again. And then we're doing like a co-living experience with a bunch of our friends um, in Europe in May. And, you know, that's like that community. You're kind of constantly going to, you know, a community that you know exists there. But it takes time to build that up. Yeah. Now, as you're going to each of these locations, obviously you figured out how it, how it works for you in – Bulgaria and how it works for you in Mexico. But in general, do you, do you find that some countries are really, really well set up to support even the concept of a digital nomad and other mm. ones, it's much more difficult. Do you see those kind of geographical variations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously you need to have good infrastructure to work. Mm. Um, you need to have internet. You know, if, if the internet isn't good, uh, you're not going to be able to be a digital nomad there for very long. Um, I think um, countries that have uh, well-developed public transport are better because, you you know, you don't have a car as a nomad. You don't want to be renting cars constantly. So um, being able to kind of like go get around town easily with public transport or even like visit other cities is really nice. Um, that's why, like, I think... Uh, Europe historically has attracted so many digital nomads and Southeast Asia for the same reason, but because flights can be so cheap there. Um, even though like in some uh, Southeast Asian countries, the actual like on ground public transport isn't that great. Um, so I think those are really key for digital nomads. Also, um, you know, Balaji had this great quote um, uh, like a year ago where he said that historically uh, opportunity is based on the latitude in which you live. Mm -hmm. And now a lot of that has shifted to it being the longitude in which you live uh, because the time zone really matters depending on the company that you work for, right? Some companies are asynchronous and so they're okay with you working in very different time zones and they have the operations and the systems to make that happen. Uh, however, uh, I foresee a future in which there's companies that say, Hey, you can be wherever you want to be, but you need to be within, you know, these time yeah. zones. Um, and so depending on what you do, you may, you know, have to, you know, kind of incorporate that in your decision of where you go. So you mentioned about employers. So let's, let's delve into that a little bit as well. Um, I'm guessing that if you're a digital nomad, you obviously have a bunch of these freedoms, but there, there's probably some restrictions in terms of the organizations that you can work for, right? So um, if it's one thing if you're an entrepreneur, you're running your own company, um, or if you're a contractor and contracting with multiple companies, but do you see a lot of di digital nomads that are working for one single employer? And if they are, um, what is it about the employer that is okay, is okay with that, if that makes sense? Yeah, great question. And again, it's something that is changing very, very quickly. So everyone, when I got started as a digital nomad, quote unquote, in 2016, everyone was either a freelancer or had their own business. Um they were like an entrepreneur. There were very few people that were actually full-time employees and they either worked for like these very strange companies that we now view as remote work leaders, like a Duis, like a GitLab, right? Like these companies, uh, Hotjar in there as well. Um, or they were developers that, you know, I think the development, the like web dev or, or uh, software kind of the, like the development world has always been its own category because as a talent, you're so important and you have so much leverage that you can kind of call those shots. And then on top of that, usually the people who are managing you understand that really you can do your work wherever. Um, so that has always been a little bit of like a, a, um, 
a full-time employment position that I've that I've met people doing that even before COVID. But now we're seeing a huge increase in the number of people that are nomadic with full-time jobs. Um, and so that's been very interesting. It really is, isn't it? And I think obviously there's a couple of things that are kind of wrapped up in that. The, the first point that you made about devs, um, devs have also historically kind of had unusual working hours, right? And so it's very, it's mm -hmm. been very common even before this would happen that you'd have devs who like to work in the evening or into the night or something like that. And employers accept that because it's just when when they do their best work. So there's an understanding of, of that there are times when they do their best work that might not map to a normal nine to five. Mm -hmm. So if you've got something that is already set up to support something that doesn't map to the, to the usual nine to five, then the way you're located also becomes kind of, kind of less relevant. And I think that ties back to your, to your point about longitude. And I suppose the second thing, which is, is really interesting is that, um, with COVID in particular, um, you did have a bunch of people who made a decision to move away from the place they were at. They moved away from being 50 miles away from their employer or 10 miles away from their employer. And now maybe they're a thousand miles away from their employer. Maybe now they're in a different time zone. So it's almost forcing employers to think about it really seriously. I was thinking about, you know, the, the recent news about Twitter and, and uh, Elon saying that everybody's going to come back to the office. It, it makes you wonder how, how even tenable that even is when the previous policy was you'll be able to work from anywhere forever. Some people um, who potentially have not, <laughs> have not already made the decision to leave or have not already been let go at Twitter may have to go because they now live 3000 miles away from their office or wherever it would happen to be. Um, so have you seen situations like that where um employers employees have made decisions based on what the employer policy was during covid and now they're in an interesting spot where either the employer is trying to change the policy back or or something along those lines i mean i've definitely heard of situations like that um i don't i'm trying to think of somebody that i know personally that's been in that sort of situation um and i don't know that i do but it's definitely happening mm -hmm. um, where people are just kind of saying like, no, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not, you know, going back to the office. I don't live here anymore. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I don't live here anymore. Right. I bought a house in another state or yeah. whatever it may be. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it is, it is going to be interesting because I also, I also, it's tough for me because I think, you know, if you have a private company, that you run, you have the ability to run it however you Absolutely, want to run it, yeah. right? I mean, you have to consider obviously like your employees' wants and what you know, and, and make sure that you can get the employees that you want to get. But at the end of the day, you if you if you have a company and you're the boss and you you know you can, that's one of the benefits of being a boss, right? Is you can say I want to run the company this way. Um, but I do think in tech you're going to have a very hard time to force these people to come back to the office because they have the leverage yeah. like we talked about. And, you know, tech, y y there's so many devs out there, yet we still have a massive dev shortage. Uh, and so that's why, you know, you're able to charge such high, high rates in that field. And, and that's why you have so much leverage. So I think the best devs are going to go to the companies that allow them to do what they want to do. And so that's my concern with these companies that are forcing people back into the office is I worry that they're going to lose the best talent yeah. uh, because the best talent is going to go wherever they can have the best lifestyle and, and get paid, you know, at the best rate. Absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. All right. Let's go back to your own, uh, your own journey. Um, we talked about the good things and, and the not so good things, but, I'm guessing you probably made some mistakes along this route as well. Things that you know now that you didn't know then in terms of how to make this lifestyle work. So, so can you think of mistakes that you've made where, whereby if people are listening and thinking themselves, they'd like to, to pursue this lifestyle, what would you do differently? Yeah. I mean, the biggest mistake I think is a lot of people start out traveling really quickly, right? So they try to like move around every like two weeks or so. And I, I think that is just unsustainable. It's not enough time for you to like set up a routine and be productive. And it's not enough time for you to 
you know, if you're working full time hours, it's not enough time for you to get to know that destination, um, that place as well. And so you kind of can can develop this like level of burnout because you feel like you don't have enough time to get your work done. And you also are like, well, I'm just stuck inside this like, you know, co-working space or this place working here. Like I might as well just be like stuck at home working. Mm-hmm. Um, you you really need to slow down a little bit so that you can have enough time to do it all so that you can have, you know, enough time to get out on the weekends and explore or take a long weekend and go visit, a, you know, a nearby city or whatever it may be. And also develop the routines that you need to stay productive and, and to get work done. Um, I also think staying longer um, is better for the local uh, population and economy as well. Mm-hmm. Because if you stay longer, you're usually not creating these hyperinflations of housing prices that we've seen so much in cities like Mexico City and Lisbon. Um, if you stay longer, you can also develop friendships with um, you know locals, which I think, you know, there's this joke about like digital nomads who think that they're helping the local economy, but they are just kind of like traveling around and not really like, you know, incorp- you know, not really like taking the extra step of getting involved in the local community. So I think staying longer allows you to do that as well. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely important. Um, I think I'm trying to think about other things. I, I definitely think that if you're just getting started in this life, I would in this life, in this lifestyle, um, I would recommend maybe doing some of these more organized digital nomad trip kind of things. Like there's a lot of companies out there where you can join and travel with a group, mm-hmm. right? Where like every month it's like Hacker Paradise, for example, where like every month you can go to a different city. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really great way to hack a community and sort of maybe take that two year period of building a community down to like a year or something like that. I also think hitting those digital nomad hotspots locations like a Chiang Mai, like a Playa del Carmen, like Bali, um, Lisbon, uh, Mexico City, going to those places early on in that lifestyle can help you also meet more people and kind of develop that community so that then when you go to other places, maybe there's someone there that you met in Chiang Mai. But like those cities tend to be kind of like magnets for digital nomads. And so going there, you can kind of hack and shorten the time it takes to build up a community. You mentioned you kind of touched a little bit on overall overall trends and and kind of how the landscape is changing a little bit. And I know that there are some macroeconomic things that are going on. We um, you mentioned a little bit earlier about the uh, the inflation that's happening in Mexico City. Also interesting right now, I think, is the number of job. Uh, a number of job roles whereby they're advertising remote explicitly as an option that appears to be going down as well. So I'm just curious as to what you're seeing overall, what trends there appear to be, how sustainable you think those trends are and uh, are there things that, that I've not seen or the, our audience have not seen that would be really interesting. Yeah. So I definitely think an, a very interesting trend uh, has been this shift out of major cities and towards smaller towns. Mm. Uh, and specifically the, those smaller towns, like being very uh, specific and very organized in their attempt to attract remote workers. Um, there's a really great platform called Make My Move that is actually helping to facilitate that in the United States. Where um, if you are a small town, you can go and, uh, you know, create a program on Make My Move and essentially advertise. It's a marketplace where, you know, you can say, hey, this town in, you know, West Virginia is offering $8,000 for you to move there. Here's what you can uh, receive, Um, which is very interesting. Obviously, I know you know about Tulsa Remote. Uh, They kind of like, you know, were the, the, the poster child for that program. Uh, but it's also happening outside of the United States. Uh, you have Gonzalo Hall, who's been on my podcast several times, who, you know, during COVID, he started uh, the Madeira Digital Nomad Project, which is um, a project in which they took uh, a town on the island of Madeira, which is a Portuguese island in the middle of the Atlantic, and they turned it into a digital nomad village uh, and essentially rerouted. Um, a lot of the tourist dollars that were like re- regular tourism, they rerouted them through digital nomads and kind of helped keep that 
um, at the economy of that town alive during COVID. And now that was so successful that he's been hired by governments uh, all over the world, including like Brazil, uh, he, uh, to, to do the same, uh, the, the digital nomad Brazil project, just, uh, digital nomad Brazil village project just launched as well. So that's very interesting. Um, other trends, like you mentioned, um, there's definitely the, uh, yes, the number of jobs open to remote workers is going down, but we're seeing a majority of, of the job applications going to those remote, um, to those remote jobs. So I think, I, I, I just think that's going to bounce back. There's no chance, uh, you know, the, the, the statistics all point that it's going to bounce back. Um, there's also something that, um, you know, maybe listeners of this aren't familiar of, but aren't familiar with, but there is a very interesting project right now called Plumia. Have you heard of this? No. So Plumia is a project launched by Safety Wing, which is um, one of the biggest uh, travel health insurance providers. They provide health insurance for digital nomads and for remote work companies. But um, what they've launched is this project called Plumia, which is attempting to become the first country on the internet. And the first part of that is they're attempting to launch a nomad border pass, which will hopefully provide um, digital nomads with a visa to like, let's say 10 countries and you get, and you apply and you get one visa, which then lets you into like 10 different countries for some amount of time in each country, uh, which is a stark contrast to what we've seen with these other digital nomad visas, which are essentially just, uh, a route to residency and a way for countries to uh, attract more tax paying citizens. Um, so they've kind of labeled them as digital nomad visas, but 99, if not 100% of those visas are not actually like for digital nomads, they're for expats. Um, so those are a few of those really interesting things that I'm keeping my eye on. Wow. That is fascinating. The Plumia thing um, is so interesting to me because it, it almost feels like a next. Uh, it's standing on the shoulders of certain things. So for example, um, Estonia, um, many years ago now, they first started, mm -hmm. they were one of the first countries to basically make all aspects of becoming an Estonian citizen electronic so that it was extremely easy for anybody who was, um, who had not uh, got any direct connections with Estonia to passed by the series of checks they needed to in order to become, if you like, a virtual citizen of Estonia. Um, and then, of course, if you think about the whole aspect of the European Union to allow kind of free travel between uh, between the member companies, you kind of take that idea of what was going on in Estonia and then what's going on in the European Union, munch those things together, and it almost sounds like you end up with with something like Plumia, where you're getting all the all the benefits associated with that without potentially some of the some of the costs. Really, really fascinating. Um, the other thing, a couple of the other things that you kind of touched upon there, which I think are fascinating when you say that, you know, this is a, this is a thing right now whereby people are pulling away those, um, th the remote work aspect of the job description, but you think it's going to snap back. We totally agree with that. I mean, w when did anybody ever get rich betting against giving people more freedom? I mean, generally, <laughs> it, it just generally doesn't happen over time. And I think you're exactly right. I think em employers are kind of, they, they think that the balance of power has shifted somewhat with some of these layoffs, particularly in tech, et cetera. And so they're, they're kind of testing, testing the waters, but it's pretty obvious already based on what you've talked about in terms of the number of applications for the, for the ones that are remote. Um, that that will be a temporary thing, and the long and the long term trends are are going to go in uh, in the other direction. Um, but on that topic of of employers, um, what do you what do you think an employer needs to do to create a really really healthy remote work environment for employees to get that? that community of people. Cause I think what's so fascinating about everything that you've been describing here is you're describing a group of people that are very innovate, innovative in terms of how they, how they pursue their own life, right? They're demonstrating 
uh, innovative skills just by virtue of the fact they're living this digital nomad lifestyle and making it work. They're pretty entrepreneurial in nature by definition. They've got a bunch of transferable talents. These are the people that you want inside forward-looking organizations. So what do, if, if employers are going to capture these people, they can't capture them by virtue of having, you know, free lunch in the company cafeteria because mm-hmm. <laughs> nobody's going to visit the company cafeteria. So what can they do to attract and retain those employees and create a really effective remote work culture inside those organizations. Yeah. I mean, I think the key word there is autonomy. Mm -hmm. I think the best talent wants autonomy. The best talent doesn't want to be told what to do when Uh, they want to, you know, be essentially trusted. They want to, you know, do work when they want to do the work. Uh, And, you know, There's this like we've kind of accepted uh, this idea that um, everyone's time is worth the same amount or that like, you know, an hour equals an an hour of your time equals an hour of your time equals an hour of your time, which is not true Mm -hmm. because, you know, we've talked about this before where, hey, maybe if you fall asleep at 2.30 like I do, uh, you're an hour at 2.30 is not the same as an hour at 9 a.m. when you're super sharp. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think what companies can do is to really kind of embrace that and not be afraid from that. Don't do this thing where I don't know how much you've seen about these mouse jigglers that are now like one of the top sellers on Amazon, which is just a sign of a diseased, uh, company. Like if you have employees that are buying mouse jigglers or you employ the sort of tactics that would force someone to buy a mouse juggler, like tracking their mouse movements. And if they don't move their mouse X number of times per hour, you're going to dock their pay. You're going to lose. Mm. I promise you, I will bet my career and name on that. Um, What you need to do, I think as a company is to embrace what's happening and look to the future and say, okay, how do we, how do we change the way that we work so that we win in this new reality of work? So I think figuring out how to work asynchronously is really key so that you can allow your employees to work when they feel like they can get the best work done, whether that's at 9 a.m. or 9 p.m. Uh, also so that they can work from wherever they want to work from, whether that's in the United States or in you know Thailand. Uh, And also as a company that figures out async, you have the benefit of then being able to hire from anywhere, right? You no longer have to hire somebody from the United States if someone from, you know, Romania is actually the best fit for that job. Um, So you, you do get that benefit by being async. I also think being a company that understands that what matters most is the value that someone creates, not how long they work is really key as well. Um, because that's all that matters. How much value do you create? And if you can do it in less time, I don't really care. Like, good for you. That's awesome. You figured something out, you know, enjoy the time off that you have now. You're being rewarded for the fact that you're more efficient. I really like what Liam Martin from Time Doctor has to say about this, which is that um, if you can figure out a way to get something done quicker than you know what we th- like think is going to take you then that's great but you have then the responsibility to teach everyone else so they can benefit from that as well um so i think those are some of those things i really think autonomy is going to be the word uh for like the rest of the century in terms of the future of work uh, because we're even seeing this you're talking about trends um, there was a really great paper in 1934, if I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong about that, called The na- uh, this, um, the Nature of the Firm. It was uh, written by a um, Nobel Prize winning economist by the name of Ronald Coase. And what he talks about in this paper is how um, a company wants to be as small as possible, but grows when the cost of doing work with outside talent becomes too great to essentially like uh, to facilitate that. So uh, if you work with a lot of outside talent, it can have a lot of transactional costs. And because of that, it's actually cheaper for a company to hire that outside talent, even though a company wants to, to stay as small as possible. What's happened with the internet and technology and the and 
now the number of companies that are comfortable with remote work is that it's become really, really cheap and really, really easy to work with freelancers and contractors. So I think what we're going to see over the next 50 years is this contraction of the size of companies where you're going to have a core team that is needed to work there along with like some automation to kind of keep the company going 80% of the time. And then some amount of time, hey, we're going to need this expert to come in here and develop a project or something like that. And you're going to hire that person out, comes in, works for six, eight, uh, you know, 12 months, and then goes on to the next project. So um, I really think, you know, autonomy and this like fractionalization of careers and uh, this like shrinking of the company is going to be the, the really interesting thing going forward. Yeah, we find that fascinating ourselves and and i would agree with all of the st all of the statements that you made there um are you familiar with exponential organizations the peter diamandis work um i don't think so my dad's a big peter diamandis yeah. uh, fan but I, I don't think i know that one. yeah so exponential organizations are are interesting they use a bunch of the of the concepts that you're that you're talking about but at the heart of it is the idea that um there's a lot of these more modern companies are tapping into uh, to abundances, if you like, that didn't really exist before, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is the abundance of, um, for example, if you were to look at, at a traditional taxi firm as an example, right? There's, you're restricted by the number of, of taxis that are there, right? But if you flip the script on that and you think mm -hmm. of yourself as Uber, for example, then there is an almost oh. infinite amount of, of car hours that are out there that can be tapped into. And so you're tapping into that abundance in order to allow you to, to grow more quickly. And you're taking, uh, and you're taking things that were restricted by the number of taxi drivers, for example, and getting rid of that at the same, at the same time. And so they have this theory that there is like this abundance of human ingenuity that you can tap into if you are not, um, like restricted to the 20 mile radius or the 50 mile radius or whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. And we fully agree with that. In fact, we formed our, uh, formed our own company based on, on those principles as well. I think there's a really interesting problem that has to be solved though, before this is, um, the, the absolute de facto norm. And that is that particularly if you go through, um, organizations in order like middlemen, as it were, in order to be able to, to reach these resources, then it's super easy, for example, to get a set of sales resources and outsource that. It's super easy to get a bunch of developers and outsource that. Um, but what you have to do, what you really have to do is you have to make sure that the trust is there between you and those people that you don't have any measure of control over and that the incentives are are aligned as well. So in other words, if you're working through an organization, uh, your incentives more aligned, uh, are fully aligned with their incentives. And what we see right now, which is really interesting, is that in many cases, the incentive of the organization is to pre-sell you on a $20,000 gig or something along those lines, right? And once they've done that, they've, mm -hmm. met, their, they've met their goal, <laughs> which is to collect your money. And then they don't actually need a renewal from you. They can go get the next one and the next one and the next one. And so it's like, how do you create that continuing, enduring relationship based on trust when you don't have the traditional employer employee mechanism to do that? Because why do employees stick with employers? They stick with employees uh, with employers oftentimes because the cost of switching is high for them because um, they have some loyalty that they that they feel to uh, to uh, to the employer, and hopefully that is reciprocated in some way in terms of the rewards that they're getting. If all of that becomes much more transactional, the question then becomes: How do you create that set of aligned incentives to make sure that as a business you're getting the results that you need from the employee when you don't have those sort of more traditional long-term relationship things in uh, in place? So I think. I think that will get fixed. Um, I think it. I, I think we're probably not that far away from it being fixed. Um, but you need to be able to do that so that the trust is inherently there. And once the trust is inherently there, and the assumption is that people will do great work, that most of the time that they do, right? And if you do that, then in balance, that is a much better situation for both the employer and the employee 
for all of the princi principles that you're talking about that are laid out in that uh, in that paper. And I I read that paper too actually, so I firmly rec strongly recommend that people do read it. It's fascinating. It's one of those things where it's like you almost wording aside where you almost feel like it's it's like yeah. it could have been unlocked from a time machine or something like that. It's 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 very forward looking, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's I'm trying to remember that other book that like uh gosh, what was uh the the book that's been like really big in the crypto space is just completely I'm I'm blanking on the name right now, but that's one of those ones where they describe cryptocurrency in like 1997. Uh -huh. And you're like, "Well, you're not using the word <laughs> cryptocurrency, but it's basically exactly what you're talking about." Yeah. But it's it's an interesting um transition because you're talking about trust mm -hmm. in in how do you trust that they're going to get their job done? How do you, you know, establish that? And I actually think the future of work in many of these scenarios is actually going to be based on the blockchain. So at the moment, I know of two projects that are developing the marriage between an Upwork and an Asana, if you might, mm -hmm. where the idea is that a company can go on this platform, create the you know project and kind of like uh, split up the project into separate tasks and then put those tasks out on the open market and allow bids for who is going to get that, that those, you know, the, the opportunity to work on those tasks. And the way that you select those people that work with you is really exciting because it's not, you know, uh, Joe from wherever it's user number, blah, 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 whatever. And so you actually might be hiring somebody uh, from Namibia. You might be hiring somebody from Thailand. You might be hiring somebody from England. And it doesn't matter because you don't know. They charge what their work is worth, mm -hmm. um, not uh, based on some sort of like conception of like, you know, how much you should pay someone from wherever. Yeah. Um, and that to me is really exciting because um, that is true equality and opportunity. Yeah. Uh, the really exciting thing about remote work is that it decentralizes opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I often think about how my parents moved to the United States from Bulgaria. And one of the reasons why they did that was to look for more opportunity. Well, now today they could have been, they could have had the option of staying in Bulgaria and working for an American company. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think that we're more and more heading in that direction. I'm very excited to see what this new age of remote work tools uh, that do use the blockchain as a bit like a, a to build on top of uh, i think it's gonna be very exciting absolutely fascinating thank you uh, for for sharing that i love it all right let's uh let's finish off then with the question about you so you've been doing this this is what you do you are <laughs> you're living the life um but what's next on this journey for you yeah, so it's an interesting question. Obviously, uh, the podcast is is one of my main things. It's called That Remote Life. Um, it's one of the top podcasts in remote work. Um, so that's something that I'm very focused on and just trying to grow it and, and you know, um, reach as many people as possible and to really uh, explore more of these concepts that, that we discussed today. Um, so that's something that I'm very focused on. And then also... Um, I'm very interested in, uh, I used to be the head of operations for a digital agency before COVID. And so mm -hmm. uh, I had the opportunity to kind of figure out how do we run this company remotely? How do we actually do this when we have 15 employees across 11 different time zones? And post COVID, you know, obviously there's been a lot of articles about uh, what is this new position that's being formed that kind of looks at operations from the remote first point of view. Um, Chase Warrington just had a really great article called uh, Do You Need a Chief Remote Officer that I recommend people check out. And so that's something that I'm focused on as well, where I've started offering kind of like fractional head of remote services for companies that uh, maybe don't, you know, they don't need to hire somebody full time to do that, but they would like someone to come in and take a look at their operations from that point of view. Um, and so those are the two things that I'm uh, at the moment most focused on. Fantastic. And I know you're going to have a really interesting guest on your uh, on your podcast pretty soon, a.k.a. me. So, <laughs> so That's right. So, yes, so, you're, you're coming on the podcast very soon. Yeah. So that'll give us the opportunity to talk about a bunch of these things uh, in more detail. Thank you so much, Mitko. I really, really appreciate it. And I know our audience will, too. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you.